open up your Bibles to the Gospel of St. Matthew. The Gospel of St. Matthew, my message is entitled, Put First Things First. Put First Things First, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to read verse 25, and then we'll drop down to verses 31 through 34. So let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. Matthew chapter 6, the message is entitled, Put First Things First. Beginning with verse 25, the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking. He says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought. You ought to underscore that. For your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body that you shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. Now drop right down to verses 31 through 34. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things, or after all these things, do the Gentiles or the unsaved people seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Put first things first. Let's go to the throne of grace. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you at the beginning of a new year. And Lord, we pray that you'd open up the eyes of our understanding in these scriptures. And Lord, we'd be able to internalize these infallible truths, that we may externalize these truths in this coming year. Father, I pray you'd bless each and every person who's coming to the house of God today. And Father, I pray you'd anoint this preacher with feet of clay, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen, and you may be seated. Well, beloved, welcome to the first Sabbath of 2021, amen, of the new year. I'm looking for the sun in 2021. I always give you a little saying. How about, you? I don't mean the S-U-N, that may come out this afternoon, by the way. I'm looking for the S-O-N, how about you? Now, I believe, if I know you people right, and I know most human beings right, that many of you have made New Year's resolutions like this. I am going to lose weight this new year. I'll tell you right now, I bet that's at the top of the list for a lot of people. I'm going to lose weight this new year. And a resolution like, I'm going to start exercising, or I'm going to be more disciplined, or I'm going to get victory over that besetting sin that I have in my life, or I'm going to be more faithful to God and more faithful to church. And I promise you, Lord, I'm going to be faithful to prayer, and I'm going to be faithful to Bible study. Well, congratulations, hallelujah, and good for you, because I'm sure you're going to keep your New Year's resolution for about a week. You see, beloved, that's about the average length of time for keeping New Year's resolutions. Now, personally speaking, I do not make New Year's resolutions except for those that I know I can keep. So, this year I resolved to eat whatever good food I want to eat. I'm going on a seafood diet. I see food and I eat it. How about you? No, I eat, try to eat good food, but you can only shop on a razor so much and it gets dull, right? So every now and then a piece of chocolate cake and deep dish apple pie with vanilla ice cream on it. I'll see you later. <laughs> I'm getting hungry already. And, and, and beloved, I resolved to exercise just enough to stay healthy. In 1 Timothy 4, 8, the Bible says, bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is, and that, and that is to come. In other words, physical exercise is good for a little while, but you're going to die anyway. But godliness, godly exercise, Paul says is good not only for this life, but the life to come. Amen? And I also resolved this year I'm going to try to get more sleep, and I'm going to try to work less hours and start listening to my wife. I mean, why torture yourself, beloved? Make yourself miserable and feel guilty when you know you're not going to keep most of these New Year's resolutions that you made. Now, let me tell you what I believe that we all really do need. What do we really need? We really need to make... Uh, is a re revolution and revolt in our life that we know needs to be done to overthrow all those bad habits and ways in our life. What do you say? You see, beloved, what we really need is to make a radical change and an overhaul in our life that we know needs to be done. Why? To get victory over our, all our lazy and undisciplined routines and practices in our life. I'll never forget, <clears throat> ultimately, when I closed my last Kung Fu school, 
I was about 50, I was 55, I guess, at that time. And I said to my black belts, I said, I assure you that 90% of you will not keep doing this after you stop coming to class. Because it takes discipline to get up every day and to do that, amen? And uh, to this day, only one of them, he stops by on a motorcycle, he sees me out in my front yard. Hey, Sifu, how's it going? But you see, beloved, it takes discipline to do a lot of things in life. And you listen to me now, the more discipline you are, the freer you are. The freer you are, the more victory that you have in your life. You hear what I'm saying to you. And what we really need to make this year is a radical change and overhaul, a moral and spiritual renovation and transformation, beloved, over our uncommitted and our worldly ways that we've been living. So this year, I'm saying, what we need to do is put first things first. Would you say amen? I'm saying this year, what we really need to do is make our personal relationship with God the foremost resolution in our life. I'm saying this year, what we really need to do is have a real moral and spiritual makeover as we draw closer and closer and closer to the Lord. Would you say amen? Beloved, that should be our top priority. That should be our main goal. That should be our primary objective this new year. That is to rearrange and reorganize and reprioritize our life and put first things first. In the ministry, beloved, when I go home, I'll have all kinds of phone calls. And I listen to the phone calls and I write them down, but I always put first things first, the ones that I think are the most important that I need to deal with right away. Those are the ones, I'll, and I do that with my whole life. I reorganize my life. I prioritize my life. Paul said he tried to be all things to all people. It's impossible to do, but you try to do it. Amen? But you can't do it without any discipline, and you can't do it without reorganizing your life when everybody wants you yesterday. That's the way I comb my hair. You know the number one question asked on the TV ministry? It's not theological. They say, do you dye your hair? I said, of course I do. I use creosote. No, I don't dye my hair. I have a lot of gray hair. You can't see it from down there because I put coconut oil on my hair when I comb it. <laughs> so you folks watching my television, don't write me again. So, beloved, maybe your failure if he asks you to keep your past and last New Year's resolution makes you cynical and skeptical about trying to do this. Yet we have to try to do what Paul said that he did in his life with his past failures. You say, preacher, what's that? We must try to forget about them, beloved. We are to move forward with our lives. Now listen to me. Paul said in Philippians 3, 13 and 14, he said this, But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and looking forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. I forget about those besetting sins that I finally couldn't conquer yet, but I'm hoping this year I can do it. I'm forgetting about all those failures of the last year. I'm looking ahead. I'm looking to victory. I'm looking to be a conqueror. I'm looking to overcome in my life. Forget those things that are mine. Looking forward, he says, to those things which are ahead. Would you say amen? So you need to forget about your past failures and disappointments, and you need to forget about your frustrations, regrets, uh, Regress, beloved, and you need to move forward, onward, and upward this new year to bring about new victories in your life that will bring glory and praise and honor to the Lord God Almighty. Despite the pandemics, the plandemics, and I call them the scamdemics of this past year, and despite the social and political anarchy and upheaval of this past year, and despite the adversities and the hardships and difficulties of this past year, beloved, we need to forget about them, and we need to start afresh and anew trusting in our sovereign God who promises that he's going to take care of you. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, I want to read about two old men sitting on a park bench speaking about how hard it was to remember things now that they've gotten older. Now, you folks who are my age, 31, you folks know that as you get a little old, you start reaching for words. Would you get me the, the uh, it goes pop, pop, pop. You popcorn, that's it. <laughs> okay. Don't tell me you don't either. You lie, you cheat, and your feet stink. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about, amen? And one of them said this. He says, I used to have that problem, but I took a memory course to help me to remember all things. And he said, it's a very simple technique based upon associating words with familiar names and places and events. And now he says, I remember everything. In fact, I do that myself. Really, said the other man, what's the name of that memory course? 
The first old man got puzzled, got a puzzled look on his face, a blank stare, and he turned white as a sheet, then he scratched his head, and he asked his friend, he said this, he said, uh, friend, what's that pretty flower that has a long stem with a lot of thorns and, and, and a lot of petals on it? He said, there's red, white, yellow, violet. He says, you mean roses? Yes, yes, thank you, that's it, roses. Then he turned to his wife, he says, Rose, honey, what was the name of that memory course? <laughs> what was the name of that memory course I took? Ah, oh, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying, hey, you've got to forget the past yourself like this old man. Amen? The problem is when you start forgetting the present. <laughs> Look, beloved, we've said goodbye to Christmas already, amen? Which is a pagan holiday, really, but I won't get into that. And we've taken down our tree and we've boxed up the lights and the decorations and we've thrown away all the leftover sweets we didn't eat. <laughs> Pastor, I didn't throw anything away. <laughs> I ate everything, right? And beloved, we said adios to our beloved family and friends who visit us and just stayed much too long. Bye-bye. No, I'm only kidding, beloved. They didn't wear out their welcome, right? And now it's time to forget about the holidays and the festivities and the celebrations. And now, beloved, it's time to get back into your normal routine and the interruption of your regular daily schedule, what you need to do. I know my wife and I, especially this time of the year, Christmas time to me is a blur. I worked all through Christmas Eve, Saturday morning, I mean uh, Christmas morning. It's just one thing after another after another. But now you've got to get back into your routine and it breaks up your time you spent with the Lord and your devotion time and your prayer time and you've got to try to kind of manipulate things to fit it in. And so, beloved, now it's time to put things first, things first, spiritually speaking, this new year. Amen? Make it better than last year in your walk and commitment with the Lord your God. Make it better than last year with your life and your devotion to the Lord your God and make it better than last year with your service and relationship to God. You listen to me, brother and sister. You listen to what I'm saying to you. There is nothing more important and essential, nothing more vital and crucial, and I mean nothing more necessary and needed to your life, both here and hereafter, than for you to constantly and continuously make the Lord Jesus Christ the central focus of your minds and your thoughts this year. Make him the central focus of your attitudes and your actions. Make him the central focus of your life and obligations. I know as I've grown as an older man, beloved, more and more his life just fade before my eyes. Not that I'm dying, okay? But there's nothing of importance. I've been around enough, long enough, and seen enough, and done enough, believe me that I see that nothing's more important than knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Nothing. Nada. Zero. Zip. Zilch. Nothing. That is, he must be more important to you than your parents or than your spouse. He must be more important to you than your family and your kids. He must be more important to your home and your job and your career and your money. Jesus Christ himself must be the number one priority in our life this year as Christians. Would you say Amen. Now, the Lord Jesus gives us three truths here that will help us put first things first. I'm going to give them to you, but you're not going to take notes on this. I'm going to As I go into them, you'll be able to write it down. Do you understand the word I said? I don't. Number one, we're going to look at our first priority. Number two, our Father's promise. And thirdly, beloved, our faithful perspective. So let's look at point number one, verse 33a. Our first priority, look what Jesus says. He says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, I want you to note the divine mandate here our Lord gives. That is to be the top priority and main concern of every believer's life. That is to be the top priority and primary preoccupation and obsession of every believer's life. I said, how many believers? Every believer's life. This is to be the... Uh, chief and foremost order of important of things above all else in our life, beloved, and that is to seek after the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then he adds, and all these things will be added unto you. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, I'm not to seek after uh, my daily necessities in life every day. That's not to be the number one priority of my life. It's not to seek after caring for your family or getting a good paying job. It's not to seek after buying a nice home and car. 
It's not to seek after a spouse to marry or, or have kids with. It's not to speak after, oh, you know what, I'm going to be so physical fit that I'd have a big uh, muscle. I've I got to tell you this quickly. I, I had a, a, a tree break, a snap right in the head in front of my house uh, in the last storm that we had. To the glory of God, I fell away from the house, right? But anyway, so I, call, I, I cut it up, and, and I called for the, uh, of course, I had to cut it up like this with my brace on. I said, Lord, if, if I don't have to bend over, I'll cut it. I always say, don't do it, don't do it, Joe, don't do it. But everything worked perfect, so I didn't have to bend. I just <laughs> went over my chainsaw, right? But I had this atheist come along, and he was six foot two, and he, uh, we started, I started talking to him about the Lord, and he really got into it. He was the most respectful atheist I had met, even though I said to him, I said, you know the Bible? He says, I don't believe Where did God come from? Where did God come from? And I won't tell you what my answer was, but I simply said this. I said, you know, Psalm 14, 1 says, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. I said, look on you. All this stuff all by itself. I said, you have a conscience? See, that's a general revelation God gives us of creation. His fingerprints are on everything. Then God gives us the moral revelation. That is, we know right and wrong. Our conscience either accuses or excuses our actions. I said, then he gives us a special revelation of the canon of Scripture. That way you can learn the word, real ways of God and how to get saved through Jesus Christ. And he says to me, he says, you look kind of stark into you exercise this as little as I can. <laughs> so he said, well, I do this, I do that, or whatever. He says, and the, 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 the guy that runs this crew told me you did the martial arts. And he, so the guy says, what do you do if a guy did that? And I punched him right to the ice up. He went, ah! I, went, oh, oh, God, all right, all right. I hit him right in the body. He had this huge bicep. <laughs> if you get a Charlie horse. <laughs> right. Because you hit him in the bicep, the head comes down, you know. <laughs> But he was, so, he was so respectful. After that, he listened to me, though. Beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying our primary uh, uh, goal this year is not to seek after monetary and material things or fun and entertainment or doing great pleasure, beloved. But mind you, Jesus isn't against these things. He's not saying, I don't want you to have fun. I don't want you to be able to have these things. That's not what Jesus is saying at all. What Jesus is saying is, you put these things before me, then you are not right with me. It's not wrong to care for your family. It's right to care for your family. It's not wrong to have a good job or career. It's right, beloved. All of those things must be submissive in submission and subservient to having Christ as number one in your life. Would you say amen out there? God doesn't want us to walk around like programmed robotic zombies and automatons. I will just seek for spiritual things. I will just seek. That's not what he's saying at all. When he says seek ye first, Implies there's other things we're going to seek. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, Jesus isn't trying to rob us of any enjoyments in life or fun in life or pleasures in life. When he says seek ye first, it implies other things we're going to seek after, that it'll be second and third, things that'll be third and fourth, things that'll be fifth and sixth in importance in our life. So seeking after spiritual things is not to be the one and only thing God expects that we seek after in our life. Because God made us to enjoy life. He made us to enjoy our work. I enjoy preaching the Word of God. And if God has called you and gifted you, I hope you enjoy your job despite the circumstances and the difficulties. And God made us to enjoy pleasure and love and marriage and a nice house and a nice car. God made us that way, beloved. And God knows that we all have personal and familial responsibilities and duties in life that we mustn't neglect, that we need to tend to, to strive and thrive and survive in this world. And he holds us accountable if we neglect those duties to our families and other things in life. Amen? God says we're to be a prudent person. A prudent man looks down the corridors of time, the Bible says, and he foresees the danger and he avoids them. So someone that's prudent, when I do something, beloved, I take a sheet of paper, put a line down the middle, cross the top, pros, cons, and I just start thinking and writing them down, Lord, guide me. And sometimes you may have more cons than pros, but still it's the Lord's will that you do it. But at least I want to be able to think it through, see what I'm doing here. How about you? You say, beloved, so these things aren't wrong in your life. They're not sin in your life unless and until they take the top priority in your life. They're first and foremost in your life unless they're the central focus and fixation in your life. In other words, they're the epicenter of your life that your whole life starts revolving around. It revolves around my family. It revolves around my job. It revolves around my pleasure. It revolves, it revolves ad infinitum ad nauseum. 
So, beloved, you can see <clears throat> what I'm saying to you is this here. All these other things, Jesus says, are going to pass away into eternal oblivion and extinction. Why, preacher? Because all these other things are tangible. They're temporal. They're, in, uh, they're transient and fleeting, beloved, and they're going to pass away. But the Bible says about God that he alone is eternal, that he alone is infinite, that he alone is immortal. He will never pass away. Would you say amen out there? And I'll tell you something else, beloved. He is to be worshipped as the number one uh, uh, thing in our life or person in our life, our creator, our redeemer. He will not, he will not play second fiddle to anything else or anyone else. Well, you know, I've come to church, Pastor, but you know, my spouse says this. Well, your spouse isn't saving you. Your first primary obligation is to your God and not to your spouse. Would you say amen? I told you, my house, I wear the pants. That would just tell you which pair to put on. <laughs> But, beloved, a lot of people say, well, I can't do that because of this, and I can't do that because of this, or whatever. I remember my children were growing up. There was all kinds of sports. And, uh, and I used to throw the ball with Kobe and football and baseball, and I wanted to get them in the Little League. But you know what? They held it on Saturday. The games were on Saturday. So guess what? We played ball in the backyard. Got a long, big backyard. Kobe, before he got his license, said, Daddy, can I cut the grass with them? Oh, sure, sure. Daddy got his license. Can't cut the grass, Daddy. Got to go to work. <laughs> you got me to cut this whole backyard to play baseball and football. Now you got to go to work. <laughs> I don't mean cut the grass. I mean cut the trees down to make it a big backyard. But you see, beloved, what I'm saying to you is this. Number one in our house was not my children. It was not my wife. It was my God. Would you say amen out there? You know, beloved, God says this in Isaiah 42, 8. He says, and my glory will I not give to another. I won't give my glory to your spouse. I won't give my glory to your children. I won't give my glory to your family. I will give my glory to no one but myself. Would you say amen out there? In other words, above everyone and everything else. Come on and say amen. You see, beloved, the apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11 Speaking about the day of the Lord, about the eternal explosion and implosion and destruction of the universe and the fiery conflagration and devastation of earth and everything in it at the second advent. He said this. He said, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Meaning this, beloved, those who first, uh, first things first must have the right priority in their life. Because if Christ were to come today, boom, this whole universe would implode and explode with the glory of God. And we will enter eternity just as we are right now. Can't change that. Oh, I should have changed. Oh, yeah, I meant to do it. And so Peter knows what he's talking about. Be holy in all manner of conversation, conduct. That's what that word means in, in godliness. So in verse 33, beloved, what Jesus is saying is this. He's saying, seek ye first God instead of good things. Seek ye first the moral and spiritual as opposed to the physical and the material. Seek ye first the eternal and the endless rather than the earthly and the temporal. Paul says to the church at Coloss, in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, he says, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things of this earth. Why? For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. For when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Would you say amen out there? Set your affections above. Seek those things which are above, he's saying, to the church of Coloss, which was really pagan when uh, to, uh, Paul got a hold of them. So, beloved, but first things first. I want you to look at verse 33a again. He says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, beloved, the word seeks is a tail. That's that Greek word. It's not a noun notice. It's a present tense verb that denotes constant and continuous action, meaning we are to constantly and continuously seek after and search after, constantly and continuously pursue and strive after first things first. And that word means until you finally and ultimately find, get and acquire that thing that you're earnestly desiring and looking for. If you ever lost your keys, <laughs> you, know, you open the drawer, not there. What did I do with them? Let me go check my jacket. 
Come here. What'd you do with my keys? I didn't touch them, Joel. <laughs> I mean, you turned the whole world upside down. That's what that word means. Turn everything upside down until you find the Lord. Would you say amen out there? Now keep doing it, layer after layer. As you peel back, you find out more about God's love and more about God's person and more about God's glory, more about God's righteousness, more about God's kingdom. You just keep peeling back the layers, amen? So that's to be the number one priority, the top, the main principal thing in our life is to seek and search and pursue and constantly strive after till we personally lay hold of it and lay claim to it in our life. But I want you to notice these two things that we're to seek first. First of all, he tells us we're to seek God's heavenly realm. And secondly, he tells us that we're to seek God's heavenly righteousness. Now let's look at verse 33a. Seeking God's heavenly realm, the kingdom of God. Now many people have asked me, and I don't have time to give you a theological breakdown of this whole thing. The kingdom of God, what does it mean? The kingdom of God means the sovereign and supreme rule and reign of God throughout the whole universe, and especially in the regenerated hearts and lives of his people on this earth. Now, there are two aspects to the kingdom of God. Listen closely. You don't miss this. You may want to write it down. There are two aspects to the kingdom of God. Number one is the spiritual kingdom of grace, and number two is the sovereign kingdom of God. I will explain them to you quickly. Number one, the spiritual kingdom of grace. This is the moral and spiritual kingdom of Christ set up, uh, Christ set up on earth at the first advent. We enter this aspect of the kingdom of God through the new birth when we repent and believe the gospel and we're born again by grace through faith in Christ as our Lord and Savior at our baptism. From that point, you go from the kingdom of darkness in this world into the kingdom of light and of That's the spiritual kingdom of God's grace here on this earth. Would you say amen out there? Now, you know, beloved, when I got saved... I couldn't believe it. I, you know, the world tells you to get some education and work hard, and I had done all those things. But then when I got saved, I said, man, like somebody pulled the veil off. I saw that there was a world within a world that I could only see with my inner heart, but it became more real than what I could see. And that's what the Bible says, amen? He says the things that we, Paul says in 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 4, that the things that we can see are not as real as the things that we can't see because the things that we can't see are eternal and the things that we can see are temporal. So all of a sudden, that veil came off my face, and I said, how in the world did I ever miss this? Did you feel that way? You said, how in the world did I ever miss this? So that's the spiritual kingdom of grace. Number two is the sovereign's kingdom of God. This is the eternal kingdom Christ is going to set up on a new earth, new heaven, beloved, at the second advent when he comes back to consummate his redemptive plan for man. And paradise lost by Adam will be paradise found or gained by the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you say hallelujah and amen? Hallelujah. You see, beloved, then we're going to uh, enter eternity and forever live with the triune God and forever live with all the eternal angels and forever live with all the redeemed of God of all ages, world without end, amen. Every Sabbath, when I get up and when I go to prayer, and when I'm up here praying, and when I'm in my office, I say, Father, would you please have the church triumphant in heaven praying for this feeble preacher down here? That your hand of grace would be upon me. That you'd open the hearts of the people. That you would anoint the message that not only those that are here, but those watching by television, that your spirit can touch them. And so the church triumphant in heaven is praying for the church militant down here on earth. Would you say amen out there? And someday we're going to enter the sovereign kingdom of God. So, beloved, how do we get into this eternal kingdom, the sovereign kingdom of God? Well, the Bible's absolutely clear on it. We get on it through faith, persevering in the faith, persevering in righteousness. That is, living a holy, righteous, and godly, obedient, faithful, and fruitful life until the end of our days. You hear me now? This is not me speaking. This is God speaking. He says, be ye holy. What? For I am holy. For no man without holiness will ever see God. That word holiness, hagios, be ye separated, be ye sanctified. Get away from the world. Don't get contaminated by the world. That's what he said. Put 
first things first. Come on and say amen out there. That's what he's talking about. So our first priority must be to seek and know God through Christ as our creator and redeemer and make sure we know him personally as our Lord and Savior. Amen. Our top priority, first priority, be, be able to, uh, it should be entering and becoming a citizen of the kingdom of God, both here on earth and hereafter, uh, beloved, and that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life and they're not blotted out lest we face the second death in the lake of fire. These should be the top priorities in our life. Everything else is a moot point. My dad used to say to me, son, if you wake up in the morning and you're breathing, everything after that is greed. And I'd laugh it off. But you know what? He's right. I, I'll never forget a few weeks ago, I woke up and said, well, still here. <laughs> right. I didn't think I was going to be. I was like, oh, night. Oh, still here. And God says, I'm not through with you yet. I'm going to get back with you for all those sins you committed when you were younger. I said, what? You know, I'm only kidding. Right? You know, I always say that just because I, I never sinned before. So, yeah. <laughs> you believe that? No. I, I never sinned before nine <laughs> or 11. Or <laughs> okay. But, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. He's saying you can't put this off as being something that's unimportant in your life life. You can't relegate this as being something that has to go on your to-do list that might be second or third or fourth. You know, a lot of Christians just think, I'm going to get up, I'm going to go to work, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But hey, listen to me now. All throughout the day, you should be thinking of your God. You should be putting your God first. You should be trying to get closer to your God. You should be acting more like your God. You should be seeking after your God. Come on and say amen out there. Okay? Seek ye first, seek ye first, not second, seek ye first, not fourth, seek ye first, not ninth. He says, seek ye first, the kingdom of God. Seek ye first, he's saying. So, beloved, daily what we need to do, we must put first thing first and start tending to our salvation and sanctification. And put uh, first things first, daily start making sure we both, uh, let me back that up, that both we and our family enter into the kingdom of God. When I got saved, immediately, Ellie and I went nose to nose. Good woman. You know how to make the butter run, huh? <laughs> Probably going to get a great meal. Hamburgers for lunch, Ellie, you're killing me. No. But trying to show her she was a sinner compared to me, there was a big, you know, she was a wicked sin. I was an angel. <laughs> But I could see, beloved, she needs to be into the kingdom of God and what she's trusting in is her own righteousness and her own intelligence and her education and her good family, whatever it may be. But praise the Lord, he opened her heart. He answered the prayer. She came to know Christ as Lord and Savior, but then she became a Pharisee. You know the way Pharisees are. She's got a Bible five times the size of that one and she slams it down like that. No. <laughs> I'm only kidding. She's not like that. When she puts the whip away, she's fine. Love it. In other words, what he's saying, you need to put God before your family and your spouse and your kids. Amen. You need to put them before your job. People say, I can't do this because of my job. Let your job defend you in the day of judgment. See how that works out. Let your spouse defend you in the day of judgment. Let your fun and your entertainment defend you in the day of judgment. My Bible says there's only one advocate with the Father. How about you? There's only one mediator between God and man. There's only one great high priest. There's only one great intercessor in heaven. The second one is on earth. He's the Holy Spirit, Romans 8, uh, 26. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, Jesus said, Seek ye first, seek ye first the kingdom of God. In other words, seek ye first the heavenly realm. Number two, he tells us to seek ye first God's heavenly righteousness. Look what he says in verse 33a. Seek ye first, he says, the kingdom of God and his Diakosune, his righteousness, meaning all of his moral and spiritual and ethical principles and precepts revealed in the word, will, ways of God and required by God's law that will conform us and transform us into the very image and likeness of God. Now, beloved, I love to cut up. I always have. I love to have fun or whatever. But when it comes to my faith, I'm deadly serious. I mean, there's some things, beloved, that I don't joke about. Not too many, because I joke on everything, right? But when it comes to my faith, I am deadly serious. 
Jesus said, make it your top priority in your life to submit and surrender yourself both to my lordship and the authority of my word. Do you do that? The authority right here. Here's the operator's manual for a Christian. We got it right in front of us. Your washing machine breaks down, what do you do? You call the guy, no. You go to the manual, right? My, my manual only has two pages. There's nothing there but air. But you see, beloved, God gave us a manual right here. He says, you want to know what I think about abortion? You want to know what I think about righteousness? You want to know what I think about sin? I'll tell you everything you want to know. All you got to do is look in my book. Would you say amen? amen. You make it your top priority. He says to live holy, righteous, and godly amidst. And he says, these are his words, this evil and wicked and crooked and perverse generation. Obey God's commandments, beloved, through the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. When we do that, that power is unlocked, unloaded, and unleashed in our life, and it transforms us, and it conforms us into the very image of God. And I've told you that for years, but you don't, yeah, yeah. If I don't take my key and put it in the ignition, that truck isn't going I can admire that truck. It's a beautiful truck. I know I like that truck. Boy, I haven't seen anything like that truck. But I can't get out of the parking lot if I don't put the key in it. Amen? Then all the power is unleashed in that engine. It's the same way when you believe and obey the Word of God. The supernatural power inherent in the Word transforms you. Listen to me now. In Romans 1.16, Paul said this. He said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of God, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone who believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In other words, there's a priority in the midst of equality. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. But notice what he says there. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of God because it's what? It's the power of God. People have said to me, preacher, I may not be able to witness like you, it's a good thing you get yourself in trouble. I don't trust in my witness. I trust, beloved. I believe with all my heart. When I was speaking to that atheist the other day, that God was trying to get a hold of his heart. And he treated me so, in fact, he treated me better than the other people who were supposedly religious and were getting all cocky. But this guy, I could see that, and I said, so you're an atheist. I said, you know, that's the most foolish thing you could say to me. And he said, why did you say that? I said, do you understand? Be an atheist means you have to go throughout the universe and look on Mars and all the constellations and you search everywhere and you could find there was no God. So you can definitely say that, that there is no God. Otherwise, you better be quiet and just be an agnostic. In other words, meaning there may be a God out there somewhere, I just don't know him. That's smarter. Amen? But you see, what I was trusting in was the Word of God would stick to his heart like Velcro and echo in the chambers of his heart and in his mind. And when he laid down, he saw that he was one step, one breath, one heartbeat away from meeting the God of the universe. He said, what are you going to do from here? And he was telling me, he was a science teacher too, so we really got into the laws of thermodynamics. And it was so funny. Because we get to the first law of thermodynamics, basically the law of cause and effect. I said, okay. Car has a car maker, bridge has a bridge maker, creation has a... He looked at me and goes, I know what you want me to say. <laughs> well, good night. That's the law of thermodynamics. Creation has a what? Creator. That's the first scientific law of thermodynamics. And the second law, I said, is entropy. What's that? Everything degenerates into chaos. Nothing evolves. What do you know that evolves? I said, you're going to bring life from non-life? You show me where you can do that. Show me where anyone has done that. Are you saying to me no one plus nothing plus time plus chance equals everything? Is that what you're saying? It takes more faith to believe that than what I believe in. <laughs> I said, you're more religious than I'll ever be. <laughs> yeah. Then he started standing up. I figured I'd better deed him while I still had a chance to get out of there. No, he was a, he was a sweet fellow. I, I really mean that. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you is simply this right here is God says, I want you to be preoccupied with learning more about me. How can I learn more about you? Should I have some uh, nebulous experience that just comes upon me? Is that how God said you're going to know more about me? Or if God says, you want to know what I think about this? I'll tell you where to look. Look in Romans 
before about justification, how to get right with God, how to be declared righteous before God, even though you're not, but He declares you righteous because of Jesus. You see, beloved, it's through the Word that you get to learn to know the, know the Lord better. And if you don't study the Word, in the Word you don't understand His righteousness, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, His just and righteous requirements, you'll never understand or know God better. It's impossible to do. So he says, to put things first, you need to seek after God. You need to seek after the kingdom of God. You need to seek after God's righteousness. You say, well, I got all these cares in my life. Hey, you know what? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 says, Casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Would you say amen? Notice he didn't say cast. Notice the verb, casting. So what are you doing every day? You cast what? You're casting. Lord, this is the burden of my heart. This is the problem right now that I have to deal with. Lord, I don't have the wisdom to think through this problem. I know what the judge has to say. I know what the lawyer is saying. I know what he's saying. I don't know. I'm not God who's lying and telling the truth. So you're seeking for wisdom. You're seeking for knowledge. And God reveals it to you in the Word of God. So that's point number one, our first priority. Number two, beloved, I want you to see our Father's promise. Look what he says in verse 33b. He says, in all these things, how many? All these things shall be added unto you. So what are all these things that Jesus speaks about here that he promises us are going to be added unto you? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? I want you to look in verses 25, and then we're going to drop down to verses 31 and 32. He says, therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on, is not the life more than meat or food, and the body than raiment. Now drop right down to verse 31 and 32. Therefore, take no thoughts, and again, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all of these things. So, beloved, the Christian's first priority is to seek after God, it's to seek after His righteousness, it's to seek after the kingdom of God, it's not to seek after food, it's not to seek after drink or clothes or the basic necessities of life. Why? Because God says He knows that we need all of those things. Would you say amen? So God says to you and I, hey, live thou to me. I've got you covered. You serve my kingdom, you search for my righteousness, and I will provide all of these things for you, for I am your divine provider. I am your Lord and Savior. I am your King. Would you say amen? I am. I'll take care of you. So Jesus says God promises he's going to do all this for us. If we'll but trust in him as our divine provider, that he will supernaturally, I didn't say naturally, supernaturally, he will su providentially, he will miraculously, beloved, he will personally provide for all of the basic physical and material necessities and cares in life that we need to thrive and survive in this world. Why? He says, because you made me the top priority of your life, and I promised you that if you'll do that, I will take care of you. Now, beloved, I've had good times and bad times in my life. How about you? I've had times of want, and I've had times of plenty. And these times of want have really been tough. But you know what? I, I, I'm still here. God provided food. It wasn't exactly what I was eating, onion sandwiches at the time. But you know what? It was still food. And me as a, a nutritionist, I know what's inside of uh, garlic and the garlic. <laughs> okay. And I know what's inside of onions. And they're good foods for you. So when you have them raw and you cry a little bit. But you see, beloved, God says, if you'll seek me, I'll take care of you. You believe that? Do you really believe that? Then why are you saying, I can't go to work? I got to go to work instead. I got to make more money instead. And God says, brother, you make money, don't make money. It's my job to take care of you if you seek me. Amen? And God promised that, beloved. You listen to me. King David understood this principle that I'm teaching you. He taught it all throughout the Old Testament. King David said this in Psalm 37, 25. He says, I have been young and am now old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor have I seen his seed begging bread. In other words, King David had personally seen God 
supernaturally take care of his family when he was young and he's wondering where the food, where the money going to come from. And now he had a hoary head and he had a wrinkled brow and he was an old man and yet God was still providing his food. God was still providing his drink. God was still providing his dress. He was providing everything he needed in life and he was an old man. Oh, listen to you. Listen to me, you senior citizens. You listen to the old timers out there. Listen to me, Grandma. Listen to me, Grandpa. God got you covered. Would you say amen? God's got you covered. You don't have to worry about that. You see, beloved, what I'm saying is this here. God says, I don't want you to worry. I don't want you to fret. Notice four times he says, take no thought. Take no thought. Take no thought. Take no thought. May marry him not ho. That is, take no thought. In other words, don't worry. Don't fear. Don't fret. You see, Gabi's Italiano, eh? He's Italian. <laughs> he says, worry about everything. Every little thing. And my wife will come to me sometimes. She says, oh, what about this? Oh, it's nothing. It's nothing. I always told her anyways, after Vietnam, everything's nothing. <laughs> you make it, out of, make it out of a war zone, everything has nothing. <laughs> Don't worry about it. But you see, beloved, he, he, in verses 25 through 35, Jesus tells us about these things that these Gentiles seek after, beloved. Whereas... Uh, you and I don't have to worry about it, but the non-Christian does have to worry about it because he has no such divine promise or blessing. Daily he has to worry and fret and fear and be preoccupied with doing all these things by his own finite human power and strength and resources. Through his own finite human struggling to live and survive and planning and l the limited assets that he has, beloved. You see, Satan is not like our Heavenly Father. If you're not saved, you live in the kingdom of darkness, and your God is Satan, whether you know it or not. Satan does not provide for his children, but God does for his. You see what I'm saying? Satan doesn't give a hoot about you, but God does. So in his kingdom, God says, I'm going to take care of you. You know, the Bible says this in Psalm 115, 12, The Lord hath been mindful of us. He will bless us. Then God spoke up in Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10. He says, fear thou not. Why, Lord? He says, for I am with thee. You ever think about that? I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God, and I will help thee, and I will strengthen thee. Oh, Lord, give me your strength. I need your hand upon me, Lord. Infuse into my soul some strength. Give me some strength in this flesh. Help me to stand up and preach to the people today. You see, beloved, God said also in Isaiah 46, 4, he says, Even to your old age, I am he, even to whore hairs, that is your gray hair, your dotage, he says, I will carry thee, and I will bear thee, and I will deliver thee. I will, I will, I will. Notice the promise, I will, not I won't. What does he say? I will. Oh, I don't know how I'm going to pay my rent next month. I don't know how I'm going to do that. Well, you, you seek God first. He'll show you how to do it. When your next door neighbor leaves his money on the table, you sneak in. No, don't do that. <laughs> Wait a minute. That's eighth commandment. Thou shalt not steal. Okay, sorry. Okay, I got it. But I want you to look at verses 21 again. He says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body that you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat? Of course it is. He says, and the body than raiment. And verse 31 says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? You see, beloved, the unsaved people of this world, you know what they're always saying? What am I going to eat? Do you see that on TV? You shouldn't eat this, and you need to eat that. You better watch out. If you don't take these vitamins, you're going to get sick. And you better take these herbs right now. All that sugar is going to be so bad for you. You know what? Sugar is really good for you if it's not refined. Take a look at the Africans that grow sugar cane, and they chew on it. They don't have any cavities because it's like little fibers going into their teeth. But you use your sanctified common sense, right? You can only sharpen a razor so much it gets dull. A little bit of this, a little bit of that, mix it together. Oh, 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 oh when it goes down there. Okay. <laughs> the slave world is always saying, listen, you better exercise. You need this machine and that machine, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do that. And Christians get carried away with it. 
Oh, man, what am I going to eat? Am I eating the right food? You know what? You bless your food. And that's all you've got. You're eating the right food. Lord, sanctify this holy. Bless it in my body that it will nourish and strengthen me that I may live a holy, righteous, and godly life and serve you. And God takes those beans and he turns it into filet mignon. Amen. You sanctify it. Something, every drop of water I put in my mouth, beloved, that's gospel truth. My lips to his ears. Lord, bless this to my body. Bless this to my body. All those sweets you gave me. <laughs> Becky, those pecan cookies was like a, it was like a assembly line. They passed along to me. I dunk in my milk. <laughs> I went through three gallons of milk. No. <laughs> well, there was only 400 cookies, so I didn't. <laughs> You see, beloved, the unsaved world worries about all of that. You know, I, I said to this atheist, he said something, oh, what if you died today? I said, you can't threaten me with heaven. It's easier to die than it is to live. My dad used to say, the dead can't hurt you. It's the living that can't hurt you. Isn't that true? You see, beloved, I know as a Christian, based upon the word of God, that if I were to drop dead right here, I'd be in the presence of God. How about you? Forever and forever and forever and forever. Now, I don't have a death wish, okay? I try to, I try to eat good food. But I don't go nuts. Even though I used to own health food stores, but people used to say to me, they invite my wife and I, what do we cook? I said, whatever you want to cook. I prefer a filet mignon, a little lobster on the side with you know, <laughs> a lot of butter and the butter, right? I always put butter and olive oil together and a little bit of avocado oil mixed together and you take the lobster tail. <laughs> we don't cut it up at our house. Do we? <laughs> Ellie takes two at once. <laughs> I'm only playing with you, okay? So many people are worried about their diets and they're worried about their health. You know my health is in the Lord's hands. If I, if I live according to his principles, beloved, I'm not going to try to misuse or abuse myself, amen? And so it, the, the fact of the matter is, like it or not, every one of us in this room, if the Lord tarries, is going to die. I don't care what kind of vitamins or herbs you're taking. I don't care how much you're juicing. If I'm going to die, I'm going to enjoy myself. I hate celery juice, unless you mix it with apples and they make it sweet. Right? But you ever drink celery juice by itself? That's like pus out of a dead man's ear all day right now. It's the worst thing you've ever tasted in your life. <laughs> I better shut up before I get carried away here. But, beloved, God says to you and I, I don't want you to worry about that. Look what he says, beloved, in verses 26 to 31. He says, he gives us a lesson from nature here. Watch what he says. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into bonds, yet... Your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. It gives us a lesson from history. And yet I say unto you that even King Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Beloved, take a real close look at the unsaved people. He's saying this, that these people are putting on, trying to buy the best clothes, look chic, look fashionable, whatever. God says, take a look at the fowls of the, uh, uh, the, fowls of the air and the, and also the fish of the sea and the flowers in the field, the birds of the air, <laughs> flowers of the field. He says, Solomon, in all of his glory, with all the wardrobe he had, with all the money that he had, didn't have the kaleidoscope of colors, the medley that the flowers of the field have or the feathers of the birds have. And doesn't God take care of them? Do you see your birds going shopping every week? <laughs> Do you see them going out trying to buy a home? God says, I take care of them, so he's showing us the preeminence of man. If I'll take care of them, how much more will I take 
care of you who are made in the image and likeness of Almighty God. Would you say amen out there? Look around you is what he's saying. Look at nature and look at history and see how I've taken care of them. You see, beloved, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, the Bible says this, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Do you have that unrivaled peace? Is it being kept? Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, he's telling you right here, be careful for nothing. God, the Holy Spirit, will infuse that peace into you. Okay, Lord, i got a stumbling block in front of me. What do you want me to do? Go over it, under it, around it, through it? What do you want me to do? You have to look at it, as, we'll say it in French, a challenge. <laughs> Inspector Clouseau, remember, challenge. It's a challenge. Okay, what are you going to do with it? I'm going to quit. You know, it's just painful. It's too much. Yeah, nothing. To God never gives you a cross you can't bear. Amen. You know, beloved, in the Old Testament, the Jews were saying, you know what? God doesn't love us anymore. He's not going to help us. And Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. He goes up to him. He says, yes, he does. He loves you. He came down here to Babylon with you. In fact, he told me to tell you in Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knewest not. Call and keep on calling and keep on calling. Call unto me. Oh, beloved, in Philippians 4, 19, Paul had been talking about how in his missionary journeys he had been uh, abased. He, the times he went without food, he was naked. He was uh, uh, naked, not <laughs> stripped. He didn't have the right warm clothes to put over him. But he says, you know, I've learned how to be abased, and I've learned how to abound. When I thought I was at my wit's end, you Philippians sent a love offering to me food and clothing. And he writes back to them in Philippians 4.19. He says this, But my God, my God, shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. My God will do that. How about your God? He'll supply all of your needs. He didn't say wants. All of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Would you say amen out there? Oh, beloved, I want you to look at that third point, and I'm going to just blow over this one. Our faithful perspective. Look what he says in verse 4. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. Forget about tomorrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Jesus is saying this. Therefore, in light of all that I've said about getting your priorities right in life, in light of putting first things first, in light of trusting God's supernatural person and power and promises and providence to take care of you in your life. He said, learn to live for today. Learn to live one day at a time, and you have much less fear and much less worry and much uh, less uh, aggravation and anxiety. And beloved, then you'll start enjoying life. A lot of people don't, don't enjoy today because they think next week, you can't believe it's going to, I'm just worried about it. Can't believe it. Hey, you may be dead by next week. Things are worse in anticipation than the reality half the time, aren't they? We start building up this thing in imagination. Oh, boy, I, know, I, I just know it's going to happen. And I know he said that to you. I, I can tell. I know that. <laughs> you, know, you drive yourself nuts. Amen. Now, beloved, I don't want you to miss this. I've taught you this before, but I want you to hear this again. Jesus said, today is all you got to worry about. Because today is now the tomorrow that you worried about yesterday. Did you get that? Today is now the tomorrow that you worried about yesterday. You see, beloved, please hear me now. Yesterday, he's telling us is history. He's telling us tomorrow is a mystery. Today, he tells us, is a gift from God, and that's why we call it the present. Amen? In other words, you can't change what happened yesterday. You don't foreknow what's going to happen tomorrow. Why are you worried about it? Right? You ever think, I know tomorrow, I know I'm going to be nose to nose with this person. I know it. I'm going to be nose to nose. Lord, just 
help me to keep this old man down. And you person calls you, can I meet with you, Pastor Joel? Yep. I, I just wanted to let you know, I was so thankful that... that, 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 that. <laughs> You're ready to put up your dukes. Come on, come on, chitty old pip pip and all that wrong. I'm not coming all right. <laughs> You're ready to go nose to nose with this person just treating you with kid gloves. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I knew you'd like that. Yes, really. I'm, so, I'm so glad you came. <laughs> Beloved, notice what he says, sufficient. You see that word sufficient? Akitos? Don't worry about yesterday or tomorrow's problems because you can't change that former and you certainly don't know the latter. Just take care of the enough problems that you'll have today. Would you say amen out there? So take care of today's business. You know, Christians are supposed to live like Christ is coming today, but plan their life like he's not coming for a thousand years. Amen? Because we don't know when Christ is coming back. He doesn't tell us that. You know, sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference between these two. But careful planning and thinking ahead about goals and dreams and steps and schedules and trusting God for help and guidance, I guarantee you it will help you put off your fear, worry, and anxiety. Amen? Lord, you've taken me this far in my life. As I look back at that plank of my life, you guided me every step of the way. I have to trust you to keep walking right here. I don't want to walk off the plank. You, know. you know, walk the plank and whoosh, into the drink. But God promises us that. You know why? Because when you're seeking God in His righteousness, you're drawn closer to God. James 4 8 says, Draw nigh to God, and He'll draw nigh to you. I was thinking, worry's well, like a rocking chair. You mean it's like a rocking chair, Pastor? He gives you something to do, but you don't go anywhere. I don't care how hard you rock. Like a Jew at the wailing wall, huh? You're not going anywhere. I learned something years ago. My dad used to say to me, a hawk, little by little goes the fiddle. In other words, take everything one step at a time. And to this day, beloved, every night I turn my concerns. I don't worry, I'm not a worry ward. I over to God because I know that he'll be up all night. How do you know that, Pastor Joel? Because he says to me in Psalm 121, 4, He that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Amen. So I say, here it is, Lord. Take care of it. I'm hitting the rack. Yes, sir, Joel. <laughs> so, beloved, what have I said to you this whole sermon? Put first things first and you'll have a happy new year. Let's go to the Father. <laughs>